was like, Sco, what do I play when I solo? I don't know what to say. I'm a, I'm a groove player. I don't know how to solo. He goes, let's play melodies, man. Like, pick a melody and play it on the drums, you know? And I was like, that's the easiest, best oh. answer to drum soloing I've ever heard in my life. Go. <laughs> What is up, everybody? Welcome to the show. Sitting with me today is an amazing artist, drummer, producer, overall soulful, funky guy. You know him from Lettuce, Break Science, Pretty Lights. Make a ton of noise for Adam Deitch. Deitch, 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 Deitch. Thanks for having me, man. Thanks for being here, dude. Stoked to get to hang. Yes, LA. I love it. So, man, you have had an amazing career. I've been following you for a long time. I was a fan way before we made friends. Thank you, man. And one thing that I really admire about you is you have been able to have all these incredible projects. But at the same time, you have made a name for yourself. This is a loaded question, but how, how do you make a name for yourself? Like, how do you make Adam Deitch a prominent thing? Not just lettuce and break science and all these projects, but Adam Deitch. Oh, man, that's a great question. Uh, my thing is just hustle and play the music that I love. And um, every project that I do, I just try to make sure it's a de- it's a piece of my soul and, and close to my heart. And uh, I've been blessed to be around a, a lot of great artists to be growing up in New York City and... And uh, I've just been inspired by a lot of people and had a lot of help along the way and um, great team behind me. And, and I get to continue doing all this. Did you always have the team? Like at what point did you get the team? I didn't always have the team. Uh, <laughs> Obviously. <laughs> um, in the early 2000s. You didn't have a team when you were at Berkeley? And- <laughs> no, nope, not then. Not then. Uh, but I got, a, you know, a couple, a couple, I had some really great friends, uh, especially in the Lettuce Guys. Um, and my good friend Eric Krasno was a, a you know, businessman, entrepreneur, like just super uh, taught me so much about the music industry and how to kind of navigate and kind of do what I want to do. And, you know, he, you know, at first I wanted to play big gigs with big artists and I got to do a little bit. I was on tour with Wyclef for three years, Wyclef Jean and Mm -hmm. did some Fuji stuff and, and, uh, you know, did three years with average white band, classic funk band and and three years with uh, John Schofield and you know between those th- like 10 years they were like all three year 10 years and yeah and they all knew i had a band they all knew i had lettuce and i think Wyclef was the last like gig i was on and he was like man go to your band man like nice. you know like yeah. out of love you know and, yeah. and i was like you know what you're right you know and i gotta get i gotta really concentrate so that was around 06 07 and that's when lettuce really started to get become the main thing you know well break science came next yeah. When, when did the Adam Deitchness kind of be in addition to lettuce? Um, well, the break science thing, I, I started in New York doing the Adam Deitch project. Okay. And uh, luckily I had this place called the Blue Note yep. to uh, kind of make that happen. Um, shout out to Alex from the Blue Note. We and, love Alex Curlin. Yeah, Curlin's my homie. Our and, boy. And, uh, and I, yeah, I was doing the late nights there on, on the weekends and... I was able to put bands together of the baddest cats, you know, my own version of the Jam Jam. Yep. <laughs> and uh, and I got to play with some amazing players. And when you call them and say, hey, you want to play the Blue Note? They're like, yeah. Yeah. You know? So that's when I started doing the Adam Deitch Project. And and I got to do a lot of, you know, play with a lot of great musicians through there. Um, um, at one point, I had Robert Glasper, uh, Robert Glasper on keys. I had Mark Kelly from The Roots on bass. I had, you know, like a killer band, Mark... Uh, Robert had just moved to New York, you know, yeah. Casey Benjamin. It was almost like the, the, the Glasper band. You yeah, know? yeah, for sure. And uh, yeah, so like, you know, I started doing that. And then the band started, you know, everyone couldn't make this thing and they couldn't make that thing after a while. And I was like, let me try to do, you know, do more of a smaller group. You mm. know, and I met Borum Lee, who's an amazing keyboard player, producer, and, you know, a master of Ableton Live and how to loop and do all that cool stuff that I didn't know how to do on yeah. And uh, we, we started uh, Break Science in about 08. And the, at first it started off as Adam Deitch and Break Science. And eventually he was putting in so much work, it just became Break Science. Just, yeah. Yeah. So that really helped out with people going, oh, okay, that, 
uh, us, um, you know, from Lettuce when he's doing this now. And, yeah. And so we did a lot of touring, and then I ended up getting the call to do the Pretty Lights thing. Yep. And uh, that was amazing. And he uh, was so gracious in introducing me to his massive, you know, EDM crowd that I didn't really know that well, you know. Yeah. And he was like, everybody, this is Adam Deitch, you know. And like, you know, Red Rocks in front of 10,000 people, you know. So he was really gracious with his crowd and kind of introducing me. And and uh, yeah, and at the next point, it, it was just I was producing at the same time and selling beats to, you know, Talib Kweli and Farrah Manch and Redman. And I had a production team with Eric Krasnow called the Fire Department. <laughs> it's so good. So, yeah, between all that and then uh, I just, the next step was to do my own records, which I, yeah. you know, the past couple of years, I have two solo records, Adam Teich Quartet. And, um, and I have two uh, elect, like kind of beat records with I, my production stuff. Which is so cool. Okay, so the Modern Drummer Festival. Mm -hmm. That was when I discovered you. 2010? Eight? When was it? Yeah, around 10. Yeah, 2010. Yeah. And I mean, especially at that time, the Modern Drummer Festival, that's the biggest thing in drumming. Mm -hmm. Nothing even close to second that I could think of in that moment. I mean, you had the VHS (laughs) or Mm -hmm. the DVD. You know, like it was a a big deal. It was a huge production. I was so nervous. Yeah. (laughs) I can only, I know in the beginning, actually, and I revisited it recently. Mm -hmm. uh, And I I could tell when you're talking on the mic after your first performance. (laughs) Yeah, yeah, yeah. (laughs) Dude, that's a huge huge spotlight yeah huge stage so how did you get that modern drummer performance slot Mm -hmm. and then how did your life change after that when i was with schofield uh we played nam show and and we uh that's where i got all my endorsements and i got with tama and zildjian and vader and yeah and uh evans and they were all really cool and i got along with all the reps and um they were always fighting for me to get into these festivals and like, you know, cause we just got along. We were homies, you yeah. know? And, uh, I believe it was Aaron from who Tamo he's now with Evans now. Yeah. Uh, he, uh, you know, he was very adamant in like pushing to get me on in things, you know? Wow. So I'm pretty sure it was either Zildjian or, or Tam at the time that, that kind of put my name in the, in, in, in there and I got in. That's you know? amazing because yeah. what, like I guess, like what level of drum stardom were you before that? Uh, I mean, like up and coming, <laughs> right? Like, I, yeah, totally. You know, because I, I feel like getting on that mm-hmm. modern drummer festival makes you like a household name in drums. Yeah, to the, the, the drummer world. The right? Schofield like, thing was very helpful, and yeah. that, that was around like oh three, like yeah, oh two, oh three, oh four, maybe. And you know, obviously, you know the the, um, the drummers he's had in his bands. You know, are, are the best, pretty iconic cats. Yeah. So uh, that was really helpful, and yeah. you know, and that kind of led led to the uh, modern drummer thing. But yeah, a- after it was incredible, and and uh, you know, I, now I have a the Deitch Academy, which I'm teaching, yeah. and like you know, doing that kind of stuff, and and thanks to that that festival, and and some of the other ones like Pasic that really w- were you know helped out, and yeah. um. Yeah, I'm just honored to do those sort of things. And my parents are both music teachers. Yep. Uh, they're both great musicians, great drummers. Um, they both went to Berklee College of Music. They met there. <laughs> and they had me at, you know, as kids, they were both like 22, 23 years old when they had wow. me. So uh, I grew up in a drum house, you know, so and, cool. you know, two kids. I didn't even own a drum set till I was like 18, you know, 17. You had your parents' kids. My, my mom's kid. Yeah yeah, 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 yeah. Oh, it was always your mom's kit? Usually my mom's kit, yeah. Huh. She had like the nice Gretsch snare and like, yeah, you know, yeah, yeah. that she still won't let me take on gigs. She's like, come on, not bring it out of the house. You know? Come on, mom. <laughs> come on, mom. <laughs> She's like, bring the mics over. You can yeah, track it. Right. I can it. record it there. Yeah. That's it. <laughs> but, man, that snare pops. So, yeah, I, I just so, you know, the idea of teaching and, yeah. and spreading knowledge in the easiest way, in the most non confusing, yeah. most non ego way, is that that's what I learned from them. So I love to teach and I, and I love to uh, do clinics and that sort of stuff. How do you, how do you think your parents, I don't want to say got you to play drums, but I know that like for, uh, as a drummer, I would love for my future children to play drums. So how do I make sure that I <laughs> actually <laughs> present it to them in the right way and not like force it on them? Right? Um, uh, my dad and you are very similar in the love that you guys have for drumming. Nice. How happy it makes you. Yeah. And that is the most important thing that will get the kid through the, the reading and the paradiddles and all that stuff. <laughs> if you first show, show the kid the love that you have and the excitement 
that you have for your favorite music, how passionate you are, yeah. how much fun the drums are. And the kid sees that. And um, th- I saw my dad like, you know, playing and he would put me on the drums and he'd get on the guitar or the piano and he, we'd just play a little bit and jam, you know, and have little jam jams in my house That's so growing cool. up. And uh, mom would be on percussion, playing congas or shakers. And, and I was just excited because they were smiling. And like, I remember them sitting me down, putting on like, you know, Coltrane Love Supreme and go check out Elvin and like check out his left hand and they were all excited about me to listen to Elvin you know and, and the same thing with like Tower of Power and yeah. uh, their favorite band Cold Blood which yeah. is like a funk band from from uh, the Bay Area and uh, Earth, Wind and Fire they're like diehard Earth, Wind and Fire Stevie Wonder and Donny Hathaway heads so just their, their excitement I, yeah. I would say you know some people, you know, some people like they start the kid with lessons and they kind of bombard them with too much technical stuff at first. Right. And for me, it was like, let's just have fun and play. Put your hands like, you know, just cross yeah. your hands and play, you know, yeah. let's have fun, you know. So that, that's that's really what they what they did. And that's why I still enjoy it. And people are like, aren't you burnt out, man? It's like, I don't get burnt out. Man. Yeah. I'm playing music I love. And this is, you know, it's a continuation of my childhood almost. For know? sure you're clearly super proficient because I know you're composing for like all these projects at once, mm-hmm. right? Just, mm-hmm. So when you're in, uh, I guess, composer mode or uh, creation mode, mm-hmm. uh, are you intentionally being like Lettuce or Deitch Quartet or Break Science? Or are you just making something and you're like, that fits with this? I am, I'm actually intentionally doing it because uh, yeah. I, I think of not only the musicians involved, yeah. their strengths, their weaknesses, how I could play to their strengths, yeah. you know, uh, musically, but also the audiences that come, you know, I'm mm. imagining like, you know, Deitch Quartet, you know, like, like in a jazz club, like, you know, Blue Note or Yoshi's and, and, you know, what is that crowd going to hear? Like what, what kind of vibe would they want to hear? Yeah. You know, and that excites me that, that, that creates the the flow where it's like, I could write, uh, you know, 10 tunes right away. Cause when I start think, envisioning the crowd and the environment, the environment, yeah. you know, and the musicians like, you know, being in their wheelhouse, throwing them a, you know, fastball down the middle, you know, with, with some, you know, the way that they play. So a lot of it is, you know, talking to other musicians and talking to, you know, my guys and Lettuce, you know, what are your favorite records? Like, who are your favorite players? Yeah. Why? You know, I'm always like on this interview kind of vibe with them. <laughs> and uh, after knowing all that, then when you write for them, kind of, it's like, oh, wow. Like, you know, they're like, yeah, this is it. We're going to play this, you know, yeah. soon. So, you know, I've gotten to, you know, they've allowed me to, you know, bombard them with demos. I do it all in Pro Tools. And I, you know, play, my dad plays guitar and keyboards. And he showed me just enough where I could, you know, kind of uh, write, you know, pretty decent demos. So yeah. when they hear it and they're, and if it's, if it, you know, if it's in the right zone, we're going to play it and put it on a record. So that I just really enjoy composing. That's super fun. Mm. What do you think is the secret to having a band last so long you know having some understanding of psychology of human psychology yeah and what you know how to uh keep people together Mm. and and understanding what people are going through in their lives yeah that kind of things it's more than just getting up there and playing and a high five and see you later you know it's like what are you dealing with how's your kids How's your life? What has your girlfriend? What's going on? And and all that stuff. And, and when people get in a fight, say there's, there's a little quarrel going on with you guys, I'll go behind each other's back. And go, you know, he was saying he loves you. You know, he was saying he's, he's you're like I, I'll Make like it nice. I'll yeah I'll, yeah I'll create a situation where like you know they're like oh he said that oh cool man like soften you know, it up yeah, yeah soften it up yeah, you know yeah. and it's like and it, we're all here because we love music and you know this is a dream like other people. You know, they're on a, a great gig and they have, you know, they're paying their rent and their car bills and the, and then the gig's over. You know, uh, the, the label doesn't have the budget for the band anymore and they're or they're changing a band. And yeah. So we're lucky that we don't have to deal with that. This yeah. is job security. Yeah. You know, so guys, let's all get along. Yeah. And keep this going, you know. And, and I got to give a shout out to Jesus uh, Coombs, uh, our bass player, yeah. who's been like kind of like the visionary since the beginning. Like, yeah. we can do this, guys. We really can. You know, like, we could be in a band and tour. We're like, a band? We, we got to get gigs. We got to like play with famous artists to survive. And he's, yeah. like, he's like, no, we're, we're going to do this band thing. It's, it's going to work, you know? Wow. So, I, you know, having that, him being so 
solidified in his vision. Not sure how it's going to happen, but he just knew it was going to happen. And uh, he believed it. He believed and it, and he got you guys to believe it. Yeah, yeah. So you know, here we are, thirty five years later, still planning playing shows. Yeah. That's incredible, dude. <laughs> thirty thirty five years. It's like you're practically in the Rolling Stones. Um, <laughs> <laughs> In difficult times, because obviously in happy times, in good times, it's easy to keep a group together. Mm -hmm. But in difficult times, or even with, because you got a six-piece band, right? Six of you. Six, yeah. In, it used uh, to be like nine, but yeah. <laughs> yeah, we used to have a lot of horn. In Lettuce, with having six people, even if it's just one person going through a hard time, mm -hmm. outside of the band, right? Yeah. Per, it could be personal stuff. Yeah. How do you keep them involved? How do you help them get through it? And how do you give yourself patience in case it takes them a while to get out of that? My, my mom, uh, get it, when she was getting her teaching degree to be a music teacher, she studied early childhood psychology and lets you know that everything that happens to you as a child is going to affect you as an adult. Mm. And I got to learn a lot about that. I, you know, she was going to college when I was in high school. She was getting her, her doctor, you know, her master's plus. And I was kind of studying her stuff with her and, and I learned a lot. So not only are they battling what, you know, whatever traumas they went through as a child, but it's also whatever they're going through with their girlfriend or their life. Yeah. And so just asking questions, being a human being, being a friend and uh, being a good listener. People want to feel heard. Yeah. As you know, you know, yeah. doing a podcast. So <laughs> please you know, listen. Please listen. <laughs> People want to be heard, man. And it's like just sitting there and listening and shutting up and letting someone talk, you know? And yeah. but, so I find that, you know, the communication levels is what keeps uh, groups together, you know, and rela all relationships. Yeah. That's definitely something that happens in any form of life, whether it's in your family life or mm -hmm. your band life your business life, mm -hmm. whatever it may be. It's all just relationship based. And Absolutely. Man. Keeping people happy is I feel like my main job in running jam card. That's like, and, and I feel like I've taken on the responsibility of, I want to keep my team happy, but I also want to keep all of our members happy, which mm -hmm. is incredibly difficult. Yeah. Um, There's a lot of people involved, you know, like we have sound guys, we have, you know, uh, monitor guys and, uh, you know, tour managers and, Everyone has to, you got to check on everybody. Make you sure everyone's everyone. cool. You know, that, yeah. uh, that that's running a business. Yeah. Cause if, I mean, you get, if someone's upset, you don't, you know, attend to their needs, I guess. Right. Mm -hmm. you, you, you have to, or mm -hmm. else like, cause that sound person doesn't have to be the bass player, the guitar player, the singer or whatever, you know, right. that can be the merge person, anyone that's in, exactly. you're, if you're moving together. Mm -hmm. we're, all, we're all out here we're all away from our families we're yeah. all away from our loved ones yeah out out on the ship you know yeah, out yeah. on the on the bus you know doing it so you just yeah you gotta you gotta be a good human and check on people you yeah know, as much as you can so yeah dude so i love how you're how at least from the outside looking in like uh how you're running your life mm -hmm. it feels super fun different projects I'm going to do this now. I'm going to do this now. I'm going to do this now. Jump it like tonight. You got a producer, uh, DJ set, yeah. uh, which I'm going to go to. I'm excited to see. Right on. And, um, which, and I, I just saw you, where were we? We were in Miami. It was at the band show. Miami. At the band, at the Miami band show. Yes. Yes. And, uh, you were playing with the quartet. Mm -hmm. So sick. Like, mm -hmm. and so I just, I love how you do that. I, I like, uh, I, I feel like I want to eventually get more playing back into my life. Mm -hmm. And I, I like this approach of like, because I'm a collaborator. Right I don't on. do anything alone. I mm -hmm. love doing things with people. Absolutely. Like, and I feel like, yeah, you're the same way. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, shout out to, you know, Gideon, my friend that, that runs all the band shell events. Yeah. And it's people like that that go, hey man, we'd love to have you do this thing. And and uh, it's always been great. And, and I've, I've have a lot of great relationships with a lot of promoters and over the years that, no, I'm a hard worker. If I'm showing up, I'm going to give the crowd the best show possible. Yeah. I'm going to be there on time. I'm, there's going to be no shenanigans. You know, it's like we're going to be about the music and make it happen. And, Absolutely. And, and uh, so I got to do, you know, the Adam Deitch Quartet, which is like kind of like what I envisioned doing jazz clubs. But here I am at like this festival, the band shell opening for the Disco Biscuits, you know, like <laughs> it was wild with all these like hippies. But, you know, I was like, hey, this is it's great. And then. I think the next day I did a, a producer set, which is, I'm not calling a DJ set. I'm from New York. Yeah. I have enormous respect for the art of DJing. Yeah. And I grew up around some of the best and, you know, like the executioners and, you know, uh, you know, obviously the scratch pickles from out here. And like, mm -hmm. so I just, 
I'm not what I not I'm not DJing. So I'm basically arranging a lot of my tracks and some of my other favorite producers to put it together and kind of uh and play percussion and play keyboards on top of it. So live, so I get to play little keys live and that's a lot of fun for me. So yeah, it's a, I'm calling it a producer set because I like that. Yeah. It's, it's my tracks and some other homies tracks. Yeah. And it's not, it's not like I'm actually selecting in the moment, you know, I'm putting together a set, you know, just like you would with a band and I get to actually play and perform and, bring my friends up like you tonight and yeah, play yeah. some percussion and yeah. jam out, you know, and add that layer of funky live stuff over the tracks you know, with the big bass booming underneath in the track. So it's, it's a fun concept. Super fun. You're going straight from these into double drumming dates with Dennis Chambers. Yeah. Come on. <laughs> the, Dude. The God. Um, What's that going to be like? <laughs> It's just, it, it's a really <laughs> wild full circle moment for me. And, yeah. Um, you know, I think of all my successes and failures and, but, and, and this is just one moment that I am looking forward to. And just to be such a fan of him and watch his career from the beginning and playing along with his uh, VHS cassettes. That's how old I am. Yep. I had the VCR and, and the Dennis Chambers videos and the Omar Hakim videos. And, Same. And I was in the basement with the TV on my mom's kit probably and playing along for hours and hours and, you know, modern drummer and like cutting out the picture out of the modern drummer and put it on the wall, you know, that kind of stuff. Absolutely. And, uh, the yeah, yellow so, kit. Yeah. The yellow kid. And, and he's just, uh, been a constant inspiration in my life. And I kind of pattern like how I, you know, just, I, I love his confident way of playing and, and he's, he's very funny guy. He's like, you know, he's always kind of mischievous in a way, you know? <laughs> so, you know, between him and, and uh, you know, what he's provided in my life to, to actually be next to him and paying tribute to the great Russell Batiste, who's also an amazing influence on me. If you don't know Russell Batiste, he's one of the funkiest drummers that ever did it from New Orleans, represents that swamp New Orleans funk uh, in a way that no one has done you know, even close to what Zigaboo did with the meters. Yeah. And Russell used to, he said he used to fall asleep in Zigaboo's bass drum as a child during meters rehearsals. Wow. Like literally like in the kick, he would lay in the, in the kick, you know, <laughs> insane. Yeah. So that, that was really cool to hear, you know, and, uh, he was a huge Dennis fan. So we used to talk about Dennis and, so we're, we're, me and Dennis are going out to pay tribute to him and, oh, it's beautiful. Be, and we have the great George Porter who's, you know, still playing extremely funky and uh, it's going to be a great tour. And George Porter put this together? Yeah. It's so cool. Yeah. What is your relationship like with Dennis Chambers? Um, he's a, a really, he's a music guy. He's got a archive of music that a lot of people haven't heard. Live shows, uh, Billy Cobham things, like random shows that he's played that no one know about. And when you hang out with him, he likes to make sure you you check it out. <laughs> so yeah, he puts the he puts uh, his headphones on you, and 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 he'll just watch your reaction, you know. And and that's what we do when we hang. And uh, it's just he'll do that for five hours straight. Cause wow, he has so much, you know. I'll be like Dennis, I'm late for the gig. Like you know, he came. We had dinner before one of my gigs in D.C. and and he just like kept going barrage of music you know listen this, to this listen yeah, to this, this. p-funk show this mike stern show this mclaughlin gig this thing you know like and it's like wow you know and then it's it's inspiring and it's i and it makes you realize how vast his career is and and you know, people know this you know people know like only a small piece of what you've done in life you know yeah but w when you hang out with the cat and they start playing you all these different things you're like oh I, I see how, how, how wide this the spectrum is and what you've accomplished, you know? Incredible. Mm -hmm. Well, I can't wait to see the videos of you guys double drumming. Yeah, it's going to be fun. <sighs> uh, so Schofield. Yeah. Played with Schofield for years. Mm -hmm. um, and I know he's played with Lettuce too and everything. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, what's your relationship like with John Schofield? Uh, he's like my, like an uncle. At yeah. The, you know, like an older brother. I, he's just the coolest cat. Yeah. So funny and upbeat like and it's rough i don't know if you know for anyone that hasn't toured europe with a jazz artist you're up at five in the morning um you're at the airport at six your flight's at seven 
and it's a lot of work, yeah. you know. And then of course at night, you know, you're in Paris, you want to go out, you want to see Paris, you know, you want to see, you know, wherever you're at. And so you're up at night doing the thing, and then you have three or four hours of sleep, and then you got to get up. and And I, I'm miserable in the mornings. I'm not. A, I'm not. I'm not really a morning guy. You know. I'm just. <laughs> and he's cracking jokes and telling you stories about jazz musicians and like wild that I can't repeat, you know, like he knows everything about everybody and, and it's all in, you know, to make me laugh, like yeah. every story. So we're in the airport pushing carts and pedal boards and drums and, and he's telling stories about people and, <laughs> so you cool. know, yeah. And we're in the back of the bus hanging like, and, and he was so politely suggesting like, you know, check out this Jack DeJunette thing, man. Like, you know, like Roy, man, you know, I was like, Sco, what do I play when I solo? I don't know what to say. I'm a, I'm a groove player. I don't know how to solo. He goes, let's play melodies, man. Like, pick a melody and play it on the drums, you know? And I was like, that's the easiest, best oh. answer to drum soloing I've ever heard in my life. Wow. You know? you know, I was like, whether it's a monk tune or happy birthday, just play it on the kit and phrase it how you want, you know? And it's kind of cleared up and demystified soloing for me in a lot of ways. That's so cool. Teaching you how to sing with drums in your head as yeah, your approach. Exactly. You know, and So he's he's significantly impacted your playing. A- absolutely. My entire yeah. life, uh, my career, wow, endorsements, um, meeting, you know, get you know, I'm not a, a straight ahead jazz player at all. Yeah. I, I I love it, I respect it. I just studied funk my entire life. You yeah. know what I mean? Funk and hip hop are my thing. So, oh, yeah. but by playing with him, I became friends with so many of the jazz community, you yeah. know, from like Brian Blade, Josh Redman, and uh, I got to meet Ron Carter and, uh, you know, and he's introduced me to that whole side of the game. And it's great because I get to be this kind of like in between guy who like, I know a lot of the, the straight ahead cats and like that live that life. And I also know a lot of like the R and B funk side and then as far as being growing up in New York and doing the hip hop producer thing, the hip hop side. So kind of putting it all together and kind of uh, just being involved with all, all those communities. And then with Pretty Lights was the EDM community, a whole yeah. other thing. So, you know, br- bridging that gap is kind of like uh, something I'm blessed to do. And, and I, I just owe Schofield so much for, for that. That's so cool. Mm-hmm. Are you wearing an MF Doom shirt? Yep. Straight up. Did you work with MF Doom? Yep. What was that? I didn't get get in the studio with him, but um, yeah. Yeah, at, at one point, Tyler Quali was kind of like almost managing us or like, you know, telling all his friends to, to you know, get beats off of us and yeah. you know, me and Kraz. And, uh, and yeah, we, we did a, a song called Fly the Knot and um, Quali was on it and he said, I'm getting a Mef Doom on this. And we're like, wow, you know, and then he, he just sent, sent it back with the vocals, you know, mix <laughs> this and we're like, Okay, great. <laughs> oh, dude. Yeah. I can't wait to listen to that. Yeah, it's uh, it, it's cool because I, I have live horns on it. Rashawn Ross, you know Rashawn? Yeah, of course. Great drummer player, Dave Matthews Dave band. Matthews, yeah, yeah, yeah. I love you Rashawn. Yeah, he yeah. was in Soul Live and Lettuce yeah. also and a uh, big part of our, our team. And and uh, he's actually on that, played trumpet. I think I sampled him at a Soul Live recording session. He was in the, in the, in the other room and I had set up my little... Uh, Triton keyboard where yeah. I used to sample things on it. I'm like, hey man, just play this thing for me. And he played it and I ended up making a beat and, and that's what became Fly the Knot with Quali and, and MF Doom. How did that work with with you and Talib Quali? Uh we're we're super super cool, man. He's yeah. he uh always looked out for us. Um he loves live music. He loves, you know, so he was one of the first guys to be sitting in with lettuce and soul live and and rocking and kind of legitimizing us in New York. As like you know, if you're if you're into hip hop, you'll you'll love these guys. Yeah, and uh, that was big for us. And he, you know, at one point, you know, I had a session one day where I was playing beats, and he's like, "Let me bring the homies over." And it's him, Farrell Munch, and Most Def. You know, and uh, so sick. And yeah, and I'm sitting there like shaking, like, "What what beat do I play (laughs) for these guys?" You know, Uh, but you know, that was him making that happen. So shout out to Tyler Quali, man, it's the homie for sure. Wow. Any other standout stories from that, from those days? Um, I mean, I was producing for 50 Cent, you know, and uh, I used to go over to the g offices and, and he'd be over there like, you know, lifting weights, you know, he's like <laughs> lifting. Tony Ayo would like 
take my skateboard. I'm a skateboarder. You know, he, he would skate around the office. Yeah, radical dude, you know. <laughs> and, and, and the guy that was bringing me over, my, my homie D. Prosper, was like, man, just keep making hot stuff and keep bringing the CDs over. I was making burning CDs in my house. Yeah. And he says, keep coming with it. Keep, you know, once, twice, you know, a week, come over. I'm going to bring you in, play it for the guys right in front of their face. And I kept doing that for like a, a series of months. And, and finally, you know, 50 cents, you know, here's this one track and he's lifting weights. He goes, is that live guitar? And I actually had Krasno like mixed way up on, on the thing, you know, one of my tracks. And I, and I was like, yeah, it's live guitar. He goes, cool, cool, cool. And that was the track that became, uh, the first song on the album, Curtis, the one he went against, uh, Kanye, you know, yes. face to face, you know? Yeah. 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 And, uh, yeah, I just couldn't believe it, and that really helped out, and that ended, that ended up, you know, I was able to afford a, a you know, a space, like a nice production space in, in Brooklyn, and uh, yeah, so shout out to 50 and, and the whole G-Unit crew. Man, that's so cool. Mm. So what brought you to Denver? It was a lot of things. Uh, the Pretty Lights thing was really huge, yeah. and, and seeing how he did Red Rocks, and, and he did it with a symphony, and... and I was like, this is incredible. And uh, I fell in love with it. And Lettuce was starting to grow. And we were, we're uh, we worked closely with this promoter, Scott Morrill, who's an amazing guy. He, he does all the Red Rocks booking now. And, yep. and he owns Cervantes, my favorite club. And so basically he's like, man, if you ever move out here, I got you. Like anywhere you want to play, whatever you want to do, like I got, you know, I'm going to make it happen for you, you know? So he's been like my, my brother uh, for a, you know, almost, you know, 15 years, something like that. And, uh, yeah, my ex-girlfriend, she wanted to move there and mm -hmm. she was like, you know, and uh, I was like, okay, let's go. And, um, I, I love it. I, I stayed and, um, you know, it's, it's a little slower than LA and New York. Yep. Uh, there's, you know, you're not, there's not a lot of records being made there. Um, but, what I like that I could do original music there. And it's kind of a religion for, for people to go to shows there. Um, I noticed in New York, you have to beg, please come to my gig, you know? And, and, uh, and they'll, they'll finally do it. But Denver is like, we're all going. Oh, it's a new band. We're all going. It's a new producer. We're all going. And it's like this like wave of people that just want to be a part of the live music scene, and, yeah. you know, as just go there and dance and be a part of it. So that's what attracted me to it. So every, you know, everything I'm doing, every project, you know, I could feel it growing just from that Denver love, that Colorado love that, that, that they bring to it. So I, I really enjoy it. That's so fun, man. I got to come out there with you. Oh, yeah. You got to do a show at Cervantes and do, do a hang and yeah. Let's good, set that up. Do a jam out there. Absolutely. Let's get it. Yeah. I know we haven't launched Jam Card uh, Denver yet. We got to do it, man. We, yeah, that's I mean, uh, you're the first call. Yeah, well, me and yeah, me and me and Scott will make that happen. There's a lot of killing cats out there, and we can bring some cats out there and kind of maybe involve some of like the electro elements. It's kind of I call, yeah. sometimes I call it the London of America, yeah, because it's got this real hybrid electronic, you know, hip hop meets funk live music kind of thing going on. So uh, before we started the pod we were uh, talking and you said something to me that really s struck a beat was you said, uh, every city has a beat. Yeah. I love that. And, mm. and you were saying that that, that goes into your approach too with lettuce when you guys are on tour and you're playing all these different cities. Yeah. Can you expand on that? Yeah. I mean, uh, you know, part of being in a, in a funk band, there's many different kinds of funk. Yes. <laughs> there's not just one thing. And, uh, like for instance, you know, let's start with new Orleans, you know, yep. you have the second line, you yep. got, the meters you have uh so many great musicians from there that created what we know today as funk music mm -hmm. and uh and rock and roll you know they still say rolling down there like from the original what you know rock and roll comes from oh how was the gig oh it was rolling man you know so that that's where rock and roll comes from like, yeah little richard is from from there you know like so you know new orleans has a beat it's got a rhythm it's got that thing so when we go there we you know, bring George Porter up, bring, you know, bring up, uh, you know, Terrence Higgins or, or, or any of the cats to play percussion, you know, bring and bring that vibe. Um, same thing with like Washington DC. When we go there, um, the go-go thing, go -go. there's no hip hop without go-go, you know, go-go was happening in the mid to late seventies. Um, and a lot of the early hip hop that happened was, were samples of go-go beats, mm -hmm. you know, or just loops of go-go stuff. And, uh, 
yeah, so when we go to, you know, go there, we, I reach out to, uh, you know, some of the great percussionists that are there and they come up and join us and sometimes we'll do the whole show. Um, yeah, so the, yeah, every city's got a thing, you know, in, in New York, we'll have MCs like Farrah Manch or, or uh, you know, Talib or whoever come up and, and LA, same thing. We got the G-Funk out here and, you know, and uh, the Bay Area has got, got that sort of like, you know, Latin funk kind of vibe. And, you know, Miami, as, as you were talking about, you know, very strong Cuban influence out mm-hmm. there. So just knowing the history and the rhythm of the city and, and, and the people that that make that city special yeah. and, and kind of involving that with lettuce whenever we go. And, uh, yeah, that, that's what it's about. So are you creating the Denver sound? I mean, the Denver sound, it's a thing, <laughs> I, I, you know. Uh, uh, you know, shout out to my friends, the Motet, you know, they're like, they've been out there for years doing funky stuff. And, and then you have a lot of the electronic stuff. So yeah, I'm just kind of making, you know, doing what I can in Denver, trying to create a, a you know, I don't know if it's the Denver sound or anything, but we'll, oh, yeah. we'll, you know, that'll be determined later, I guess. Uh, I saw Jeff Basker just posted the guest list. Yes. And I saw your name on the guest yeah, list. Yeah. What's going on there? Uh, I just went last night. Uh, me and, Jeff and I started Lettuce, uh, yeah. and in you know early the early days, me him and Eric I Car- did not know that. Yeah, wow. Yeah, yeah. I I was in the Jeff Basker uh, fusion trio at Berkeley. Yeah, and uh, he, he was writing these really intense funky fusion tunes that were like Chick Corea level tunes, and uh, I knew this guy was special. You know, yeah. I, I, Steve Jenkins was a bass player, amazing bass player, uh, lives out here now, and. Uh, at a certain point, I was like, you got to meet Krasno and, and Jesus and the rest of the guys at Smirnoff. And uh, Jeff, you know, came right in and it was like, okay, guys. And he was like already like this musical director kind of vibe, you yeah. know, MD, you know. And he started like teaching us like really like hard Herbie tunes that we were, you know, we needed to be taught these tunes. Like he knew the chords, the hits, everything. And, you know, from, you know, Spankily, Palm Grease, Actual Proof. Uh, Spider, all those tunes that, oh, yeah. that that became part of our repertoire. He was kind of like teaching us these tunes, you know. And um, you know, we, we were we did the first album together, and and then um, we we all left school. I was in a hip hop band. I got signed to Interscope. It was a whole different thing called Fat Bag. That you know, and and everything kind of got you know crazy at that point. We all moved to New York, and Jeff, you know. He, he's just a genius and, and uh, he started playing me his tunes he was writing oh this guy's a genius you know and so last night he uh yeah i don't know if everyone knows but jeff is one producer of the year at the grammys and oh yeah thank jay-z and chick korea from the stage you know so gangster so he's uh been an amazing influence on all of us and just to see him last night doing his tunes piano vocal and every songwriter in la that really cares about the craft was there and yeah it was, it was really cool, and you know, it was it was a clinic. It was a songwriting clinic. Yeah. Yeah. Oh man, I wish I would have gone. Yeah. I saw that. I was I was we were messaging back and forth, um, and uh, I haven't we haven't met each other yet. We're just yeah. uh, IG friends. Yeah, he's a great dude, man, yeah. and he uh, he he's got is a wealth of information. Yeah, he yeah. seems incredible. It's so cool to. I feel like you just think of him if you you know as a massive pop writer. Yeah. Writing these huge pop and hip hop mm. songs. Yeah. So to hear about him actually be like having the MD vibe in his blood, being Muso, doing the Herbie, the yeah. Herbie tunes. Herbie back and then. Chick yeah. and all the funk, James Brown and Prince. He is yeah. a Prince like encyclopedia. Yeah. Um, yeah. He, he taught us so much about just music. And I remember I, I, I think we, for Thanksgiving, I was like, you want to come to my parents' house? He's like, yeah, cool. He came to my parents' house and I think he played the piano in my parents' living room and, we always had like a baby grand there and my mom and dad heard him. They go, your friend's special. You know, he's, he, he different, you know, and they were right. And, <laughs> and they were absolutely right. They knew. Yeah they, yeah. they knew right away. Yeah. How was the, uh, Zildjian 400th event? The nervousness was only matched by the modern drummer. But it's what he's <laughs> like, it was because like, it's one thing to have like, you know, you know, rest in peace, Aaron Spears and, I know. and you know, Sticks, Sticks. Taylor, and, and Antonio Sanchez, it was my, my Berkeley homie, we went yeah. to school together. So it was One of like, the greatest drummers you know, out J- there. Justin yeah. Faulkner, yeah. like Bradford, like, you know, it was, the list was crazy and uh, I was overwhelmed. But then you add 
Sheila E., Dennis, Omar, Eddie Bayers, you know, and, and Steve Smith. And they're like in this kind of like American Idol panel, like yeah. looking at you, <laughs> you know, like like you're being judged, you yeah, know. Yeah, yeah. But they're just so happy to be honored, you yeah. know. So I had to like, okay, you're just honoring, you're just paying respect. But man, I don't think I slept for like three days, like, you know, the rehearsals, like, and then the hangs, you know, the drummer hangs, as for you know, sure. are the best, you know. Drum, drum community is the tightest of all the yeah. instrument communities. Absolutely. We just vibe, you know. Man. And, um, yeah. So it, it was incredibly nerve wracking, especially during the show, you know, just seeing Dennis and Omar up there. You want to play your best. And I remember my ears weren't working. I'm going up stage and like the ears aren't working. So I had to play with no ears and like wow. no monitor. And, you know, it was just kind of like one wow. of those situations, you know. But I've been through it all. I've been through all the technical stuff. And at the end of the day, just like, just make a groove, man. Yeah. Make it feel good. Yeah. You know? So I vibed out with the musicians and just, you know, kept my eyes on them and just acted like it was just the three of us in a room, four of us in a room. And, yeah. And just made it happen. Man, oh, I, I regret not going. Eric Lederman, our homie, mm -hmm. uh, invited me out and I was like, I should go. But for what, something, whatever, I had something. I couldn't mm -hmm. go. And I was like, because so many homies were on the bill, yeah, too. It was just yeah. like a bill full of the homies. Yeah. And I'm, I'm especially bummed I didn't go because, I mean, who would have thought Aaron was going to pass, man? Like, right. Who uh, would have thought? Like, we uh, had just talked. He's one of those guys yeah. that's always checking in. Absolutely, man. How he you was, doing, bro? Like, always checking in. He was, like, hugging my parents. And, like, we, all, we hung out. Like, you know, it was, like, me him and mom and dad were just, like, hanging for, like, 20 minutes. Yeah. Like, he was, like, so gracious with his time. and Oh, he's the best. So, the yeah. realist, yeah. you know, and... and that's why Usher put his kit up, you know, up at, at, at the, the Super Bowl. Bowl. And because this guy was special, he wasn't, you know, he reached out and he really cared. His heart was big. And yeah. so, yeah, he's greatly missed, man. Like, you know, that, that was, and I'm so glad I got to spend that Zildjian 400 hanging with him and, and getting to spend some good quality time with him, right. You know, yeah. at that point. And uh, also with the other guys, you know, and I, I learned so much and, and uh, I got we, everyone watched each other's performances on the TV in the backstage, big TV with the stereo. So it was like you know, bunch of drummers around. So you go back and everyone's clapping, and you know, it was it was so just, cool. It was great. It was camaraderie, and it was frightening, and it was all the things. So, uh, <laughs> we did it. <laughs> I'm surprised you still get nervous. Oh yeah, it never. It, if you're not nervous, you're not alive. You know, like damn, I'm not alive then. Uh, you don't get nervous, man. Never. Wow, you must have that gene that like. Do, do you like like do thrill seeker stuff? And, no, like, I don't. Jump out of planes and stuff. No, I hate that shit. <laughs> I hate I hate skydiving. I'll never do it. I don't want to scuba dive. I went snorkeling, had a panic attack. I, me, too. <laughs> me too. Me <laughs> too. I'm not a thrill seeker, but with music, I guess that's my thrill. Like yeah. I'm I'm super comfortable improvising uh -huh. and now with the jam jam is just a giant improv right yeah i mean there's moments of course of structured improv but a lot of it is just like what's gonna happen right like, uh, that's just... beautiful improv is beautiful i mean it can be scary also it of course yeah. can be scary but i guess i feel like it's my job to put the best people on stage around me mm -hmm. that i love and respect and look up to and like you know that being the paint i guess with the canvas being the stage and just being like all right this is gonna be great there's a great mix of people which is it, n of course not always mm -hmm. doesn't always happen but even the jam jam has grown to we've done i mean we did it this summer in front of sixty thousand people i saw that i saw the videos it's yeah. an improv right it was with free nationals and a bunch yeah. of homies. and like um i wasn't nervous at all mm -hmm. um, and you know i and for and that's like and it's different because when we do the jam jams and they're like in the private setting when we yeah. do it with with Quincy or George or any of these people or mm. dumb bunch with sticks right yeah. like um uh those are it's it's easier to because it's like you know oh this can be three hours or whatever yeah, we can yeah. just go uh -huh. and it's like all right we can I, I have all I want to make sure I get everybody up all mm. these people but like it's not like when we have a festival set and it's mm. like 75 minutes. Right. Starts at six, ends at 7.15. Yeah. Ends, right? Mm. With a throw and go. You know how these festival throw and goes are. Mm. No sound check, just uh, doing a line check. Yeah. So I was like, okay, I've done, I've done, I've done throw and goes festivals a million times on tour. Completely mm. different when it's like 20 musicians mm. not playing rehearsed music. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> it's not an ensemble with the same uh, in-ear guy that you always mm. have, right? It's like yeah. different monitor. It's like, 
you know, everything kind of pieced together. Right on. But I, I, even with that, I don't get nervous at the jams. So you, you got that confidence, man. That's beautiful. I don't know. I, you know? I don't know what I it mean, is. I mean, the Zilzer 400 thing was scary because I, I'm playing a tune that Omar played <laughs> on a Schofield record, <laughs> you know, and... In front of him. In front of him. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, and... With uh, every other great drummer watching. Watching that. <laughs> and, you know, and they all know, you know, Dennis knows everything Omar played on that record. So, you know, so I just felt the pressure of that, like please let me pay, pay tribute to this in the right way. Um, shout out to Omar Hakim. He, he oh, yeah. Nicest my, guy. He gave me a, a nice you know, consolation handshake after. Good work, man. I was like, oh, thank God. Thank you God. Know? Yeah. But, uh, you know, that, that that's when I get it. When it's, you know, when you're paying tribute to someone and, and, and their life's work, you want to do the best. So I guess that's what made me a little nervous. <laughs> I don't know. I understand. Yeah. Lettuce gigs. No nervous. I'm good. You yeah, know, it's, your, it's, like, it's 35 years later. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I wrote the tunes. It's like, it's, like an old, it's like an old glove. You know, you just get in there and do it. Um, so, yeah. So, both of your parents, music educators, drummers. Mm-hmm. You grew up in a super musical household. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, today I feel that music education is more important than ever. Mm-hmm. Right? How much it's changed your life, Absolutely. my life. It's everything I can't imagine not have learning, not learn music as a kid. Mm-hmm. Um so yeah, what what do you think? Like, so right now we're doing a big push right now to try to get more music education in schools. I love this push. You know, I'm down with this. And you're the guy, <laughs> right? I know it. And, and and we got the state of California is now behind it, and there's this mm. whole Proposition 28 bill that has passed. Can we do that a round of applause real quick? Yeah. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Teach the kids, man. Like, get good teachers. Get people in front of them that that are fun and can inspire. You know, that's yeah. the most important thing. Yes. Um, so I, I feel like uh, my thought is that there's going to be, or that there are, and we're, we're, it's already being proven right now. We have 3,000 artists that have already signed up on school gig mm-hmm. that are interested in teaching. Yeah. Because we got to make more teachers, mm-hmm. right? There's not enough right yeah. now. So now there's funding from the state to hire these teachers. Yes. Who are the teachers? Yeah. Right. So mm. as a call to action from you to a musician, that may be interested in doing a you know career change, right? Mm-hmm. Or a, having a new opportunity of like, hey, you can make a steady income right now, still doing music, but you're teaching the kids absolutely for four hours a day, six hours a day, right? I love and then it. go and play at night still, do mm-hmm. your gigs, you yeah, know? yeah. Like, uh, what, yeah, what do you think about that? Like, for uh, to 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 any musician that might be interested in teaching, it, it's a it's a glorious profession teaching. Uh, my parents. It, it always keeps coming back like students that you know graduated music college is coming back to my mom thank you for being the original inspiration of in my life thank you for realizing i had talent when my parents didn't wow um you know sometimes a really talented kid is born to two doctors or to people that don't know if their kid is good or not yeah and it's up to a musician or a music teacher to recognize that talent I think that's one thing my mother was always great at. She was setting me up with bands when I was five, six, seven years old of kids that she was teaching because she knew that they were great yeah. before their parents did, yeah. before anyone had given them. She was like, you have great ears. You have great time. So they really, uh, you know, they, they taught me how to do that and how to recognize talent and how to know certain kids like deserve that push. They deserve to know that they are good. And they have something special. And if they work and they put the work in that they could do music, you know, that they could become musicians and, and, and do this for a living. Oh, it's amazing. Well, big shots to your parents. Mm-hmm. Your parents, I, I can't wait to meet them. But can I meet your parents? Absolutely, man. They're, they're, they're like the parents of the scene. They're like, the, the, you know, they're amazing. And they love to play and hang and jam. And th- th- I want to bring them to a jam jam. That they, yes. they, Mom will definitely play and, and, Groove everyone out the room. Yeah. Oh, I'll be like, bring your Gretsch snare, mom. Yeah, bring the Gretsch <laughs> snare, mom. Come on. <laughs> well, dude, thank you so much for coming here. Thank you, Bo. You're the man. Love you as a drummer. Love you as a friend. Great guy. Adam Deitch, ladies and gentlemen. Come on. Oh, Come God. on. Adam Deitch. Thank you. I uh, appreciate you, brother. Go see every single Deitch project. Mm. Check out the Deitch Academy, mm-hmm. which is awesome, man. So, yes. Much love, uh, my we bro. got a new yeah. We got a new lettuce record coming out real soon. Let's go, and uh, you know, just we're gonna keep making these records and and keep hitting the road and getting in front of people and doing it doing it live. We got to do the Adam Deitch Jam Jam.
Get lettuce up there. Yes, bro. Get up. Just get all your projects. Make it happen. We could do bro. it like Jules Holland style, but all your projects. <laughs> wow. I'm down. Go all right, I got to find the money. Go <laughs> Let's go. Adam Dites, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs>